Of the two big cinematic multiversal adventures that hit cinemas last May, I think it's safe to say that one has eclipsed the other. Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was a thrilling, well-performed romp, replete with some classic Sam Raimi flourishes, but everything everywhere all at once was, well, it was everything everywhere all at once. In the months following release, even a lot of Marvel fans began pointing to everything everywhere as an example of what the Doctor Strange sequel should have been, how it should have used this multiverse conceit. And while I do agree in a lot of ways, the A24 film was a lot more creative, narratively, visually, thematically, in approaching this multiversality, there is a moment in the Marvel film which I keep coming back to. Where's this? Home. We don't spend long in this place. We don't even really visit there. While the film does see Doctor Strange and America Chavez hopping between a few dimensions, this is just a memory, a memory of the universe America is from. And yet, I think this is one of the most crucial moments put to film in this age of the multiverse, because we're seeing a text brushing up against the very edge of what is possible, or rather, what is possible for a blockbuster like this to imagine. What are the limits of the multiverse? At first glance, that question might seem paradoxical. Isn't the whole point of this conceit that nothing is out of bounds? That somewhere out there, every possible timeline, every possible configuration of potentiality is playing out, is there for us to see? Well, you might think so, but that isn't really what we've seen. The multiverse as a concept is nothing new, but in the last few years, it's become mainstream, become an increasingly central part of much new media particularly, though not exclusively, in TV and film, perhaps most notably forming the backbone of Marvel's Phase 4 and acting as the core of the aforementioned Oscar-nominated Everything Everywhere. We've also seen Sony and DC, for instance, leaning more and more on the concept, and over the past year or so, it seems the very notion of cinematic continuity itself has become a mere adjunct of the multiverse. With all this new multiversal focus, though, you may well wonder, why is everything still so similar? I'm not talking about the different continuities, the different Spider-Men, X-Men, Batman, now designated Elseworlds. Most of these settings weren't initially conceived as multiversal, as different divergent timelines. I'm thinking more about the spaces we travel to, or whose inhabitants visit us. I'm thinking about the worlds we see in everything everywhere, within which these alternate Evelyns are found, the snatches of difference we see in Loki and What If, the alternate realities Strange and America jump to in their flight from the Scarlet which, and the homeworlds of Spider-Verse's variants. In these settings, specifics change, characters make different choices, technology becomes sleek and futuristic, traffic lights switch their colours, fingers become hot dogs, but the worlds these things are happening in are just so very normal. We are offered a few fleeting glances at different worlds, really different worlds, but it's impossible to ignore that without fail, the main bodies of these works of multiversal fiction recoil from real difference and content themselves with superficial difference, masking an underlying sameness. What then is the essence of this sameness? Where are its outlines, and why do they seem so firm? Well, to answer that, we need to talk about capitalist realism. It is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. That quote's been attributed to a few different people. Frederick Jameson, Slavoj Žižek, H. Bruce Franklin, but perhaps the first person to really investigate this idea, to dig into how capitalism's managed to camouflage itself as the default, as a non-ideological ideology, was Mark Fisher in his 2009 book Capitalist Realism. Fisher's concept of capitalist realism describes this. The way late capitalism, particularly in the decades since Thatcher and Reagan, has enmeshed itself so thoroughly in the mind of the capitalist subject that not only has it become accepted as the only viable political and economic system, but that even imagining an alternative has become impossible. I want to suggest that this is the essence of that multiversal sameness. That this is why it's so rare to see another universe that doesn't boil down to New York but better tech. Because imagining anything really different but still modern, still human, is now all but beyond our ability. We do see glimpses in these projects of unfamiliar worlds, but they're either non-human or utterly peripheral. 
Instead, the vast majority of the worlds we've seen in this recent bubble of multiversal media, practically all the ones which have any real bearing on the stories being told, resemble our own. Resemble late capitalism, just wearing different masks or painted in different colours. The result of capitalist realism is an inability to envisage any modern human society that doesn't look more or less like ours, so the distributed bureaucracy of sorting out your own tax return becomes a symbol of inevitability. And it's easier to pitch, it's easier to watch, it's easier to believe a world of hot dog people than a world not driven by market imperatives. Because if we are seeing different worlds, alternate timelines, that is what we should be seeing. Capitalist realism describes the way we take this system for granted, the way capitalism simply become understood as the natural, inevitable endpoint of human social, economic, and political development. Of course, it isn't. Historians such as Robert Brenner and Ellen Mexins Wood have shown that the emergence of capitalism wasn't a foregone conclusion, that the eventual development of capitalism after thousands of years of human commerce was driven by the particular particular, distinctive system of social property relations in the early modern English economy. Capitalism denies its own contingency. Modern society no longer effectively opposes, questions, or even really perceives the political system which controls it, but it isn't a given. It never was, and so there's no historical reason that fiction which explores the different possibilities of human development should presuppose its presence. It's forgivable in stories set in alternate timelines which only recently diverged from our own, but that isn't all of them. Everything Everywhere, of course, imagines a world where humanity developed from hot dog fingered apes, and yet the modern day is identical. Spider Verse introduces a pig version of Peter Parker who's from a world of anthropomorphic animals that developed exactly as ours did. These examples are humorous ones, are riffing on the alternate timeline tropes, but the non porcine examples operate the same way. Everything is on the table. Everything can be different, even how many dimensions the dimension has, except for the socio-political system in which these alternate humans live. Individually, there's no problem with any of these worlds, but surveyed as a whole? The multiverse trend is the perfect indicator of just how limited our culture's imagination has become, because what we see is a glut of media oriented around a concept which should be anathema to this capitalist realism, instead displaying just how ingrained it really is. Even Everything Everywhere, supposedly the most imaginative multiverse project, isn't able to imagine an alternative. In a fairly important moment, that film does create a different space, a space in which its characters can decompress from the economic and social strains of modern life, but the only way it's able to do this is to locate this space in a timeline where humanity never existed. Look, I like the googly-eyed rock scene, of course I do, but it's telling the film has to go this far, has to abandon humanity altogether in order to escape the pressures of capitalist modernity. This is why that America flashback in Multiverse of Madness stuck with me. Because here, finally, we see something else. We see human life in another form, different but recognisable. I don't want to oversell this moment, but it is interesting, right? The fact that this film seems aware, on some basic conceptual level, that human life can exist outside the bounds of capitalism. We can see dim sparks of this awareness elsewhere in the text, too. Food's so free in most universes, actually. It's weird, you guys have to pay for it. To be clear, capitalism isn't simply the condition of having to pay for food, but I imagine it's a fairly good multiversal litmus test. Unfortunately though, this is pretty much as far as it goes. Though the film does appear to grant that alternate human life ways beyond our world, our world but sleek, our world but incursion are possible, the closest multiverse of madness, billed as a wild exploration of a chaotic zany infinity comes to imagining them, is a line of dialogue and a 10 second memory memory which, for various paratextual reasons I'll maybe lay out later in a Patreon endnote, might not be so potent a vision after all. Far from representing some dormant multiversal potential, to push beyond capitalist realism then, to revive the ability to imagine humanity beyond capitalism, I think in moments like this, we see the limits of the multiverse. We see that the only spaces these projects can imagine, or trust their audiences to believe, are close analogues to our own. We see they might gesture toward wilder, liberating possibilities, but that they can never meaningfully inhabit them. 
even in media driven by the conceit that anything is possible, that everything exists out there somewhere, capitalist realism isn't conquered, it's reinforced. And I do mean reinforced, not merely surrendered to. Because in acquiescing to these borders of what's realistic, what's believable, these projects begin to take an active role in the propagation of capitalist realism. According to Fisher, one of the ways in which this capitalist consensus is maintained can be seen in the difference between reality and the real. This is a distinction inherited from Lacanian psychoanalysis, so you know, woof, but to simplify, reality is the way we understand the world, and the real is the world, the thing we're trying, often failing, to see through reality. To quote Fisher, The real is an unrepresentable X, a traumatic void that can only be glimpsed in the fractures and inconsistencies in the field of apparent reality. One of these fractures, for example, is the way our capitalist reality responds to the threat of climate change. All that's possible, all this reality can do in the face of a crisis which lays bare the fantasy of infinite growth and resources upon which the system depends, is greenwash, is incorporate environmental concerns into to marketing strategies. As Fisher writes, environmental catastrophe features in late capitalist culture only as a kind of simulacra, its real implications for capitalism too traumatic to be assimilated into the system. This is all fairly abstract, but what I want you to take away here is the idea that reality, as in what is considered realistic, the way things are, is on some level a mythology, a constructed, naturalized mythology that we subconsciously use as a key to interpret our unknowably complex existence. With that in mind, consider what we've been discussing. Consider a sequence of media properties purporting to explore, to imagine the multiverse, to visualize a series of fabulous other worlds, where things are wildly different, where different choices were made, the butterfly effect in full force, but which really just display funhouse reflections of the mundane. This, we're implicitly told, is all that's available to imagine, to inhabit, to explore. By proposing this multiverse conceit, and proceeding to use it in such a limited way, this reality, this mythology of what is believable, what is possible, and what is not, is affirmed again and again. Each time smears on another layer of concrete, hopeless capitalist realism. Look, you guys have all seen that Disco Elysium screenshot. You've heard that the corrosive power of capital is such that any critique of capital is eventually subsumed by it, so by now this whole general paradigm should be a familiar one. But all the same, it is bleakly ironic that in the mainstreaming of the multiverse, alterity itself has been bounded, in the way we've taken the idea of other worlds, of every other world, and used it to recreate our own, again and again. Multiversality had the potential to reveal the limits of this capitalist reality, but the opposite ended up happening. That reality came to define the limits of the multiverse. And even if you're not convinced that this is something worth thinking about, isn't it just kind of boring to meet variant after variant whose homeworlds are instantly familiar, to see these stories of flight, of jumping haphazardly from one reality to another, and to never feel truly disoriented, to never see a vision of human existence fundamentally different to our own? Look, none of this is to say that nothing like this has ever been done. Comics, for instance, have made more ground here than live-action multiverses. Fisher's pervasive sense of capitalist realism is still present here. Most of the non-capitalist worlds we see in the Marvel print multiverse are either dystopic, ruined societies operating in the fragments of our world, or recognizably historic worlds, atavistic throwbacks to life before late capitalism. And it's generally the same from other publishers. But I think it's it's fair to say that before the past few years, before the multiverse went mainstream, this limitation was less severe. So the point here isn't multiverse bad. The point isn't even that this manufacturing, this propagation of the capitalist reality myth is the sole function of the cinematic, the mainstream multiverse. But it is a function, one that must be confronted, and the first step toward that confrontation is surely awareness. Awareness of where the limits of these multiverses are, why they stop there, and what that stopping affirms.
Maybe this video will age like milk. Maybe Everything Everywhere's inspired the next great multiverse story, one more able to imagine and inhabit alterity. Maybe the Spider-Verse sequel or that Flash movie will pull something out of the bag, shock and wow us all with a vision of the multiverse that leaves the familiar well and truly behind. The Ant-Man 3 PR trains included a quote about the Quantum Realm being Marvel's Dune. And even if the Quantum Realm isn't technically a different universe, that feels vaguely like a step beyond the mundane worlds we've been shown previously. Personally, I hope it does age like milk. I'd love to see these projects get weird, get new. But if it doesn't, if the next few years of multiversal blockbusters continue in this mold, then maybe just bear this video in mind and remember that these limits don't extend into the real, that other ways, other worlds are possible. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you thought below, leave a like if you're feeling generous, and hey, if you've got any mates you think could find this video interesting, maybe shoot them a link. I'd also like to shout out my much appreciated Patreon supporters on screen now, especially Ryan Emily. Thanks guys, and I'll see you all soon.